Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
sing it like they're really happy They sing it like they're really free They sing it like they are a sparrow They sing like they Sometimes it's hard to hear you Sometimes it's hard to remember to want to Sometimes it's hard to fall apart in your arms when I Sometimes I think I'll never know Sometimes I think that I knew it too long ago Sometimes I think that if I blink I will sink but then Sometimes I change my mind a lot Sometimes I change the foundations of every thought Sometimes I change to take the pain And arrange it into some Good morning, Cross Point. I want to share an opportunity for our community to partner with Wake Ed Partnership. Wake Ed Partnership is a local nonprofit that supports the efforts of Wake County Public Schools. We have an opportunity to participate in the Tools for Schools school supply drive. I want to share with you that this is an effort that is near and dear to my former teacher heart. Prior to becoming student pastor at Cross Point, I was a teacher in Durham Public Schools for 15 years. And I wanna take a few minutes to share my heart with you regarding schooling in our community. You see, we have entered new territory regarding the teacher shortages in our community. At this moment, according to the positions that I can view online, Wake County Public Schools has 388 vacancies. 
in elementary teaching positions, and 205 vacancies in middle grades teaching positions, and 196 vacancies in high school teaching positions. If you are the parent of a school-aged child, your child is likely entering into a school that is not fully staffed. And I know that for many of us, that brings up a lot of emotions. We know that it means that our students will feel the consequences of sitting in large classes, having teachers that are not certified in the areas that they teach, having teachers that are additionally certified, but they don't have time to prep those quality lessons or return our emails because they are teaching other classes in order to cover gaps in positions that have a vacancy. And we know that our students deserve better, and we fear that they will not receive a quality education. When we know this, often we get overwhelmed with emotion and we look for who can we hold accountable. And I wanna give you a gentle reminder. It's not the teachers that are showing up every day to give us the very best that they can. This, the fault here is not on the teachers. This crisis is systemic. Our teachers are left to work within a system that is failing them. If we are overwhelmed, saddened, and worried about the education that our students are receiving, I want us to remember that our current reality should not surprise us. We have known for decades that teachers in our country are overworked and underpaid, but many of us didn't view that as an issue that we needed to take urgent action on because we weren't feeling the effects of it in our own schools. So the system persisted. Schools in more affluent communities have long been insulated from the teacher shortages that have plagued low-income communities. This school year, we will be feeling the effects of the massive teacher shortage in our country, in our community, and in our schools. I wanna talk about how we can respond as a community. First, I wanna acknowledge that there is a desire to just run from this and not think about it, put our heads in the sand, and I get it. And some of you are in a position where like, you're able to hire a private tutor to fill in the gaps in your child's education as a result of the teacher shortage. In fact, due to the mass exodus of qualified teachers from public education, there are lots of qualified tutors in the market. In many ways, this is a worthwhile support for your child. But if we stop there, I want us to acknowledge that the kids that are left not receiving those additional supports in a, from our education system are almost always kids from low income or lower middle class communities. And as Christ followers, we are called to be deeply committed, not just to our own children, but to the vulnerable as well, to do for others as we do for ourselves. This is why supporting public education needs to be a priority for all Christ followers. And while public schools serve a broad range of students from a variety of backgrounds, no institution in our country is serving students from low income homes like public schools. So if we are going to care for the poor and for the children, as we are called to do, then we need to be passionate and serious about the work of public schools. So how can you get involved? Well, there are several ways. First, funding for public ed education is allocated primarily at the state and county level. I strongly encourage you to contact your elected officials and ask them to prioritize funding in to increase teacher pay and to invest in programs that recruit and retain highly qualified teachers. North Carolina used to be a national leader in its programs to recruit highly qualified teachers, but those programs have been severely defunded. You can find more information about how to become more politically informed and active um, and help you advocate for our public schools by checking out a couple of sites like ednc.org or publicschoolsfirstnc.org. We also need to be community members that understand the enormous stress that comes with being a public school teacher. As a country, we need to accept that a teacher's primary job responsibility is delivering content in an engaging, accessible, yet challenging way. And we need to see a reduction in the workload and responsibilities of public school teachers. That means we need to find creative ways for volunteers to help take some things off of their plate. Things like supervising students at lunch or before school or after school. We need volunteers to run student clubs or make copies or prepare hands-on activities to help plan field trips and more. If you have availability to volunteer on a regular basis, please contact your local school or reach out to your child's teacher and ask about some tasks that you can take off of the plate of teachers, particularly tasks that aren't actually
actually part of teaching. If you want to go a step further, remember that a massive teacher shortage has also led to a massive shortage of substitute teachers. If you have availability and you are able to be a substitute teacher, please do so. Finally, I want to point you toward the Tools for Schools school supply drive that we are having here at Crosspoint. Beginning next Sunday, July 31st through August 21st, you can drop off, drop off much needed school supplies in bins that you will see located around the building. For a full list of requested items and more details, I encourage you to go to crosspoint.org slash supply drive. I hope that you choose to participate. This is a tangible way that we can show our teachers and students that we're going to help fill in the gaps because we want them to have a great school year. And it's through acts of generosity such as these that we continue to live out our faith by meeting very real needs in our community. There are many ways we collaborate with each other to be the church we're called to be and to serve how we serve. And our contributing financially is one of the most important of those ways. If you want to help fund and sustain what we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org contribute to see the many simple ways that you can do so. You can even text CrosspointNC to 77977 to receive a link to get started now. Thank you for your partnership in the work we do together. So today I want to walk through a few different passages of scripture and try to knit together what life was like for people of faith during a particularly difficult time in history for the Hebrew people and see if there's any way we can find our own stories and their stories. First, let's start with an encounter Jesus has that we find in the New Testament book of Luke. It goes like this. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Now, there are several different things that we could unpack in this brief encounter that Jesus has with this woman, who, interestingly enough, we don't read anything else about in the scriptures. But what I want us to notice is that she's been suffering for 18 years, bent over, crippled, in pain. And yet this Jewish woman, is clinging to her faith, still showing up at the synagogue after 18 years. Over 18 years, you have to understand, that's 936 trips to the synagogue. 936 times of slowly putting one foot in front of the other, enduring the pain, refusing to give up. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about what do you do when you feel like you're just done? When you've showed up 936 times and you don't know if you can make it to number 937. Because I imagine all of us, to a wide varying of degrees, knows what it feels like to just want to be done, to just want to quit, to give up. And what we find throughout the scriptures is that that struggle is not unfamiliar to people of faith. And so again, I want to walk us through one particularly gut-wrenching time that we find recorded in the Hebrew scriptures book of 2 Kings chapter 25. It starts in verse 1 this way. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city and built siege works all around it. Now, some explanation here. Zedekiah was the king of Judah. Now, around this time, which scholars believe was around 589 BCE, the people of Israel were divided into two different kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And Judah was the name of the southern kingdom. And so it says that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which was Israel's public enemy number one at the time, marched against the most holy and sacred city of Israel, Jerusalem. And Babylon employs this strategy where the army completely surrounds the city. Now, this was a common strategy in the ancient world because you basically end up cutting off the city. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out. No supplies, no food, no drinking water. And the strategy is the army sets up camp in a circle around the city until one of two things happen. They either one, they surrender, or two, they everyone inside the city dies from starvation, thirst, or disease. It's basically just a strategy of just wait them out and not lose members of your own army in the process. 
So that's what's happening here in this particular passage. Verse 2. The city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. So, if you do the math, that's about two years that the people in Jerusalem have been surrounded by the Babylonian army, who in turn have completely cut them off from everything. And so the resulting famine began to crush those living inside the walls of Jerusalem. Another author writes about this same famine in the book of Lamentations. Listen to how he describes the severity of it. Because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children, who became their food when my people were destroyed. So obviously, this is as bad as it gets with famine. Now look back at the next verse in 2 Kings 25, verse 4. It says, Then, which again, this would have been about two years later, the city wall was broken through. And the whole army fled at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden. Though the Babylonians were surrounding the city, they fled toward the Arabah. Now, if if it isn't clear already from what we've read, this should tell us all how bad it is if you're an Israelite at that moment. The famine's gotten so bad that the Babylon's like, you know what? We can just go ahead and break through the walls now. They're not going to be strong enough to provide any resistance. So they do. But when that happens, the army in Jerusalem, the trained men who are supposed to protect you if you're an Israelite, the ones who are supposed to defend you in the city, the text says that the Israelite army and their king Zedekiah are just like, yeah, we're out of here. Every man for themselves. So they begin fleeing in the middle of the night. But not for long, verse 5. But the Babylonian army pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him and scattered. And he was captured and taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah, where sentence was pronounced on him. They killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then they put out his eyes, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. Now, even after that, the suffering still just keeps getting worse. Look at verse 11. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained in the city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had gone over to the king of Babylon. But the commander left behind some of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and the fields. So, the poorest of the poor, the peasants, get left behind to work in the fields to now work as essentially slave labor for the king of Babylon and produce food for the people of Babylon. But those Israelites, especially the young men, that were deemed as potentially more productive. They were taken captive as slaves and brought back to Babylon in the hopes of them over time becoming loyal to their new nation. So as part of that brainwashing process, not only were young men taken from their homes and their family, but they were often castrated and given new names. This is what we see being described in the Hebrew book of Daniel, where it says, Then the king, which was Nebuchadnezzar, Uh, which was Nebuchadnezzar at the time. The king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So, he brings in four young men who meet the criteria to indoctrinate them into Babylonian life, and he gives them new names. And some of you, if you grew up around Bible stories, you may be familiar with some of the stories of these four men. They were named Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All four of them, if you maybe, again, grew up around hearing Bible stories, they get thrown into a furnace for refusing to bow down and worship a statue of the Babylonian king. Later on, Daniel gets thrown into a lion's den. These are those guys. And so this context is how they end up there in Babylon. And so all of this was the context the people of Israel were living in at this time in history. And it was in the midst of those circumstances and reflecting upon them that these words were written by an ancient songwriter in the book of Psalms 137 verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. So again, this is written by a songwriter 
who had been ripped from their homeland, ripped from their families, experienced terrible suffering. They'd been taken captive and being held in Babylon. And they write, here in Babylon, we sit and weep as we remember Zion, which Zion was a nickname for Jerusalem. So they're thinking back and reflecting on their homeland, reflecting on Jerusalem, their most sacred city. Now, one can only imagine the thoughts and questions that these people of faith wrestled with, right? At that moment, looking back, thinking like, how could God have let all of this happen? I mean, we were supposed to be God's people. Is there even a God? Does God even care if there is a God? I mean, how bad does it have to get? Because it doesn't feel like there's any end in sight to this suffering. But look at what the songwriter writes next, verse 2. He says, There on the poplars we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? So, here's what I want us to notice. Years ago, author Rob Bell pointed this verse out to me, and it stayed with me ever since, where they say this line, there in the trees, we hung our harps. And as you reflect on that, essentially what they're saying is it's this poetic way of stating, we're not going to sing praises to God anymore. We're just going to hang up our harps. We're done. Too much has happened. Too many disappointments. Too much suffering. There's no signs of things getting any better anytime soon. So you know what? We're just done. And the thing is, I think a lot of us know what that feels like. We think about what's happened in our own lives, what we've been through, the, the disappointments, the betrayals, the violence. We look around at the way things are happening in our country and in our world. We hear some of the incredibly toxic and mind-blowing things that people declare in the name of God and the name of Jesus, and it makes us cringe and think, you know what, there is zero way I want to be associated with any of that. And maybe in some ways you've just hung your heart. You've checked out. Maybe in some small ways. Maybe it's in some significant ways. And perhaps you even find yourself showing up and listening to this right now. And the reality is you're teetering on the edge at any given moment to just hang your harp, walk away, and be done. And I get that. I've been there and I frankly still get there. Just depends really on the day. Sometimes it depends on the hour. And obviously each of our situations are different and the things that can put us on the edge can be different. But what it is for me these days is mostly this huge disconnect I continue to see between the life and teachings of Jesus and how Christianity gets practiced in many faith contexts, how it gets portrayed in cultural and political conversations. And it makes me angry. It makes me often embarrassed to be associated with it to the point when strangers ask me what I do for a living, I'll often say, yeah, I lead a nonprofit because that's true. Because I feel like, though, if I say I'm a pastor, I have to immediately offer all these disclaimers like, you know, but I'm not like one of those pastors that you're probably thinking of. I mean, I really do believe in science, that black lives matter, that women and the members of the LGBTQ plus community are equal in every way, that America, while I'm grateful for it in many ways, isn't God's chosen country or even a Christian nation. And the list goes on and on with all the disclaimers I feel like I have to put out there all the time. But in those moments when I find myself most teetering on the edge, I find myself Coming back to the words of a dear teenager from Cross Point who years ago shared in the midst of having one of these types of discussions. And she said, you know what, but if we just all walk away from it, aren't we just letting the oppressive voices successfully hijack the message of Jesus? I mean, who's going to stand up to those voices and say, no, that's not the way of Jesus. And then offer what love actually looks like. And that, that conversation continues to echo in my head all these years later. And at least for now, it keeps bringing me back to the hard work of trying to participate in love and justice and resurrection in the world. And that inevitably keeps bringing me back to Jesus. And that keeps bringing me back to this community here at Cross Point. To link arms with you, a community of people who want to do the same, who are willing to be a part of a loving resistance that says, no, what? No, you know what? We're not just going to walk away. We're not going to just let it all get completely hijacked without standing up and saying something. And we're not going to stay quiet on issues of love and equality and justice. And even though our voice may be in the minority much of the time, especially in the context of faith conversations here in America, with all that makes the headlines and gets the most clickbait on the internet, we let ourselves be reminded that originally Jesus's voice was the minority voice of faith by far in his context. 
Jesus' message of inclusion and grace and love and generosity was opposed and mocked and rejected by the dominant loud religious culture at the time. And so we embrace, we're a part of the loving resistance. And I'm for one grateful for this community of people that will be a part of that loving resistance together because we need each other. And as crazy and difficult as this world can be, there's something incredibly powerful when we can gather together online or in person where we find ways to show up and love and serve and sacrifice and be generous together, express our voice together. That reminds me, you know what? I'm not alone. And it makes me want to find ways to show up so that you know, you know what? You're not alone either. But that's my thing lately. And I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what thing may be causing you to want to hang your harp and just walk away. But here's what I do know. You're not alone. And your experience isn't isolated from other people of faith over the past thousands of years. Later on, another songwriter in the scriptures cries out this way. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? There's something about that type of honesty that I find really comforting. Because I think we can all be like, you know what? I know what that feels like at times. And yet, I also find just as compelling the way that the same songwriter ends that song. Where they write, but I trust in your unfailing love. There's this sense of, you know what? I'm going to keep going. Even though it's hard. Even though my emotions are all over the place. Even though the current circumstances can feel isolating and alone and unjust, I'm going to cling to love and to grace and to justice and to the God reflected in Jesus that is about those very same things. A couple weeks ago, I came across a video from Kara Lawson, who is the women's basketball coach at Duke University, who was giving a talk to her team recently. And I just felt like it would be good to share with all of you as well. So let's take about two minutes and let's watch this together. I, I was talking with, with Shay a couple days ago, and one of the things we, we talked about was um, how we all wait in life for things to get easier. Think in your own life if you've waited for something to get easier. Oh, I just gotta get through this and then it'll be easy. I just gotta get through preseason and then it'll be okay. I've just gotta get through my junior year of high school and then the classes are gonna get easier. Or I've just gotta get to my spring and my senior year of college and it's gonna be easier. It's what we do, we wait for stuff to get easier. It will never get easier. What happens is you handle hard better. That's what happens. Most people think that it, it's going to get easier. Life is gonna get easier, basketball is gonna get easier, school's gonna get easier, it never gets easier. What happens is you become someone that handles hard stuff better. So that's a mental shift that has to occur in each of your brains. It has to. Because if you go around waiting for stuff to get easier in life, it's never gonna happen. And then what happens? Oh, it's so hard. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, this, I don't know, when, it, when is it gonna be easy for me? Oh, it's easy for other people. It's not, it's hard. And the second we see you handling stuff, handling hard better, what are we gonna do? We're gonna make it harder. We're gonna make it harder. Because we're preparing for you for when you leave here not just basketball and life. And if you think life when you leave college is gonna be all of a sudden get easy because you graduated and you got a Duke degree, it's not gonna get easier. It's gonna get harder. So make yourself a person that handles hard well, not someone that's waiting for the easy. Because if you have a meaningful pursuit in life, it will never be easy. If you're trying to win a championship, if you're trying to have a family, ask your parents. Do you think it was ever easy for them to raise kids? Karen, is it easy? It's not. Any meaningful pursuit in life, if you wanna be successful at it, it goes, it goes to the people that handle hard well. Those are the people that get the stuff they want. People that wait around for easy, you probably see them at the bus stop. They're waiting for easy, the easy bus to come around. Easy bus never comes around. You've gotta handle hard. Okay, so don't get discouraged through this time. If it's hard, don't get discouraged. It's supposed to be. 
And don't wait for it to be easy. Oh, I just got to get through the summer. And then it'll all of a sudden get easy in the fall. No, it won't. It won't. It won't get easy in the fall. So make yourself someone that handles hard well. And then whatever comes at you, you're going to be great. You're going to be great. Okay? I love her challenge there. That things are never going to get easier. That what we're invited to be is people that learn to handle hard better. And that's how we actually move forward well. In one of his letters in the New Testament, one follower of Jesus named Paul puts it this way. He says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Now, let's pause there for a moment because the thing is, we all want our character to be marked by perseverance, right? I mean, if we have kids, we want their character to be marked by perseverance. But the irony is we can easily find ourselves trying everything we can to shield ourselves and shield our kids from any type of suffering, the very thing that produces perseverance. And yet Paul writes, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, Paul was no stranger to suffering. He was mocked, abused, beat up, slandered, all the things. And yet he says, ultimately, suffering leads to hope. Now, here's the thing I want to be clear about. I'm not going to try to project on your circumstances and simply say, you know what? You just need to persevere. Because here's the thing, sometimes perseverance gets equated with things that it's actually not. For instance, if you're in a toxic, abusive situation, persevering does not equate to you. Just staying and simply trusting that someday you'll be glad that you did. It's easy to see how that type of language can be used to manipulate and control people, especially in toxic religious systems. Rather, persevering can mean doing everything possible to get out of that toxic and abusive situation and persevering through the fear of the unknown to do what's actually healthiest and most loving and honoring to yourself and to your own dignity as a human being created in the image of God. But here's the point I want to wrap up this all with today. In the spirit of Paul's words, that perseverance leads to character and character leads to hope. Perhaps something to keep in mind is that when you choose to persevere through suffering, it's us who actually get hope. Perhaps it's not only just about you, but perhaps it's also about us. That somehow, by seeing your life, watching your character play out, seeing you persevere through difficulty, standing up against injustice, practicing generosity, leaning into community, still showing up with love over and over again, not letting your voice of peace and equality get squashed simply because it's in the minority, we can say, you know what? If they can keep moving forward, I can keep moving forward. If they can get up, I can get up. If they can live, I can live. If they can still follow the way and pattern of Jesus by participating in the story of redemption and resurrection, so can I. If they can take down their harps that they've hung up and keep going, so can I. If she can keep putting one foot in front of the other after 18 years and showing up trusting in something bigger than herself, so can I. Perhaps it's us that gets the hope. And perhaps it's people you'll never even meet. Which brings me to one last thought. I just feel like I need to make sure that you know that Crosspoint, this community as a whole, by our collective willingness to keep showing up and participating in the story, whether you realize it or not, it's giving a lot of hope to people across the world. I speak to people literally from all around the world nearly every week who reach out to me in some way, who have stalked our website, who have stalked our videos, who find out who we include and stand up for and what our values are, and they go, I had no idea that a church community like that existed anywhere in the world that it even could exist. And over and over again, what they land on at the end of the conversation is that seeing us do this together, seeing an actual community of people linking arms to do this together gives them hope. So Crosspoint, may we be a community marked by perseverance. May we be people that are vulnerable and honest about what we're going through. May we be people that show up for each other and for those who need shown up for all around us. May we keep learning how to handle hard better and may we find the story, the Jesus story of love, grace, inclusion, redemption, and resurrection worth giving ourselves to even when it gets really hard.
If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org slash care. And welcome home.